All right, well, hello and welcome in. You saw the title of this video, you know what this is about. So I'm actually a Broncos fan, and I'm not really what I expected to transpire today when I found out that the Broncos and the Bears were going to be playing each other. But I do know one thing. Matt Eberflus, if you are a fan of the Chicago Bears, this man is public enemy number one. He deserves to be fired. The whole city of Chicago should be in pitchforks today if he is not fired. Um, and I am recording this at 2.25 a.m. Pacific Standard Time uh, on Monday, October 2nd. So I expect him to still wake up with the job tomorrow, unfortunately, because why would you fire a guy? What adjustments can you make midseason that can, you know, revert all the disastrous moves you've made? Um that is at least what the McCaskies, I believe, will tell themselves. That, I believe, is what Poles will tell themselves. As they tank for Caleb Williams and, by way of Carolina, they get Marvin Harrison Jr. So, good for them. But what transpired today between the Broncos and the Bears was a very, very wild, uh, entertaining game in itself. Entertaining for all the wrong reasons, but there's one thing we need to point out. Vance Joseph's defense gift-wrapped you a Justin Fields game of a lifetime. Justin Fields played an amazing game of football. Through three quarters, the only incompletion I remember him getting, like through the first three quarters of the game, was a Hail Mary at the end of the half. That was literally knocked down. Everything else was wide open. But Bears going to bear. At one point, they had a 28-7 to lead over the Broncos. And I was like, let's go. We're going to fire Vance Joseph. But Justin Fields is the second quarterback ever in NFL history to throw for 300 yards, four touchdowns, and 80% plus completion percentage and still lose the game. And for those who didn't get a chance to watch the game or catch the game, let me just sum it up. So the final drive by Chicago was an absolute masterclass on why I truly believe this generation growing up of Madden players would be able to handle situations like these high leverage situational drives that can determine whether you win a game or lose a game late in the fourth quarter why guys who have literally picked up a controller once and played a game of madden will be able to do it than dudes right now who are doing it for a living and i know that sounds absolutely ridiculous but let me just that's the way i feel after watching eber and getsy's management of the final drive so the Broncos run defense was getting gashed by Khalil Herbert, especially at the end of the game in the fourth quarter. And I do think going for it with, I think they had three minutes left on Denver's 20 yard line, fourth and one was the correct call. Because while the Bears D is terrible, um, the Broncos D is historically bad. So I don't have an issue with going for it. Um, you weren't winning the game if you didn't convert, and they didn't convert. Um, Spoiler alert, yeah, they didn't win. <laughs> and I don't hate the call to go for it. I hated the play call. Everything in that drive went to Khalil Herbert, and Herbert was gashing them, like I said. But a shotgun handoff on fourth and one, absolutely inexcusable. Inexcusable play call for everybody involved. If there's one thing I hate more than anything else, it's bad football, bad play calling, bad execution. And we got all of that from the Bears in the fourth quarter, despite the fact that this was very, very winnable. They had multiple chances to put this game away. Let me just say, I think it was, I think, you know, Fields and Poles were dealt a pretty bad hand because Poles literally, like, we'll get to all this later, but he inherited a huge mess and Fields was a part of a roster that was littered with holes everywhere. And he was a part of said mess, don't get me wrong. But Poles deserves a chance to write this ship. Now, granted, um, this team went for fields in the draft in 2021 when they were clearly not in a position to do so, even though they made the wild card not even three months earlier. But they massively overperformed at the end of 2020 and got the pleasure of being one of the first wild card teams that was an overmatched seventh seed against the two seed. But ever since then, it has been a cratering effect for the Bears. Absolutely, like, domino effect of bad move after bad move to the point where it's a mudslide. Back to the game itself today. What sticks out to me is the Bears' lack of a defined process. Tight end sneak with Cole Komet. 
it looks cool when Jalen Hurts does these gimmicky things because his offense puts up points at will. The Eagles have Jalen Hurts and an offensive line that consistently runs over other teams. The Bears have a center who gets false start penalties when they try to draw the opposing team off sides. And Getsy is just as big of a part of this as Eberflus is. Like, trust me, he is not exempt from criticism whatsoever. But considering Getsy had the opportunity to build an offense around Justin Fields, and you know what? He has. They have done that at times. But what sticks out to JT O'Sullivan and the other guys who like to grind film is that this team either has bad weapons, which is probably true for the most part, uh, skill position guys are really unimpressive, or the scheming just does not make it easy for the skill guys to run their routes. Because, yeah, they have pieces. They have DJ Moore. They have Komet. They have Roshan. They have Khalil Herbert. And, yeah, while that's a pretty, I mean, you know, I think all those guys bring something individually. But after that, it's absolutely laughable. But the fact that the scheming doesn't make it easy for untalented players like Claypool, like, you know, I don't know, Bayless Jones to run routes. I mean, yeah, I don't I don't know. Getsy is just on one in Chicago. And yes, he has built an offense around Fields that has looked good at times. But I feel like a lot of that is just due to Fields' amazing running ability. And we knew that he profiled as a historical rusher coming out. Uh, very, very fast player. And, you know, he's crazy. He fits the mold of an NFL quarterback. He fits the mold of what you should need to compete at an NFL level. Now, there's a chance that his brain just can't process an NFL defense. And that's, I mean, we'll, we'll get into all this later. But, I mean, I just want to finish my thoughts about the game. Um, the f- ending of the game, the second half of the game was, this is all I'll have to say about it. So, the Bears forced a three and out to start the half. They went down the field in 15 plays and scored to go up 28-7. Denver scored a touchdown in a seven-play drive to respond, uh, 28-14. Went three and out again. Then they let Denver score. The Bears went three and out. Then they let Denver score 10 plays instead of seven this time. So 28-21. Had that complete disaster of a fumble play. That was the game-tying turnover and touchdown recovery for the Broncos. Went down the field with Khalil Herbert, touching the ball literally every play of that drive. Went for it on fourth and one. Did a shotgun run into the defenders, which led to a turnover on downs. Broncos go down the field again to kick a field goal. Then a game-ending interception. Four possessions after going up three scores. One three and out. Three absolute disastrous endings of drives. To Matt Eberflus, people were kind of talking themselves into him this offseason because Fields had showed flashes last year of being a franchise quarterback and being able to make plays, and that's pretty much all you could have hoped for last year, so that's completely fine. But the main thing I'm perplexed about is how does a defensive guy lead one of the worst units in the league over the past two seasons? There's no life, there's no personality in the Bears, and you can literally see the product on the field as a result, no pun intended. He's put together a laughingly bad coaching staff. Nothing should be said about Getsy or Williams if you're a Bears fan, because at that point, it's just beating a dead horse. We know everybody needs to be gone unless they have some sort of, unless they have some sort of stud position coach we don't know about yet. But Fields is 0-15 in his last 15 starts, and here's my thing. Is Justin Fields a bust? I'm still not declaring one way or another. Brian Flores had the football world believing that Tua was bad. Um, before, they played a historically bad defense today on the other side of the field. The Bears' offense looked completely inept at literally everything this year. Is it Fields' fault that he may not be the answer? No, especially with what he has shown so far. But I think even the people who are not big on Fields and weren't big on Fields coming out of Ohio State can admit that they've almost basically failed Fields in regards to literally everything during his time with the organization. I mean, what have they done for him? They've traded for Chase Claypool and... Oh my god, I don't even want to describe what's going on with Chase Claypool because that's a completely separate video and it's just, like I said, bizarre situation and everyone knew they got fleeced at the time. This isn't even me in hindsight being like, this was bad. Look at any tweet, look at any, you know, Reddit thread talking about that move at that time. 
everybody knew that the Steelers fleeced, and you literally traded the 33rd overall pick for a guy who was told to stay home this past weekend, and it turned into Joey Porter Jr., who was projected by many to at least go in the first round. You draft Bayless Jones, strange, strange day three pick, and didn't really make much noise as a rookie. Why was Bayless Jones on this team's radar, and why did they take him in the early third round? Oh yeah, and they signed Byron Pringle. Cool. Yeah, and I'm just kind of tired of ranting about the Bears at this point, because literally everything is a mess. Fields deserves way better. This team has allowed the other team to score 25 plus in 10 straight losses that they've had. Schematically, it's just amazing to me what Eberflus is doing that isn't working and putting his team in positions to be successful. Oh yeah, and one bizarre thing I haven't even brought up is didn't the McCaskey family give like three potential head coaching hires to their GM candidates to choose from uh, when they were hiring their GM in 2021 or 22? I can't remember the exact year. But yeah, every article regarding the hire of Eberflus seems very wild from the get-go, and this guy could legit be a one-win coach if not for Trey Lance in a hurricane and walking off Davis Mills. He's the guy behind the biggest losing streak in Bears history and the biggest blown lead in Bears history, which was that 28-7 lead that they had at home today. And against all guys, you blew this lead to. I haven't even talked about this. You blew it to Russell Wilson, who has been the most scrutinized player in the league since September 2022 when the season began. The Bears have two sacks on the year and the lowest blitz rate in the entire league. Shouldn't a defensive-minded head coach be able to figure these things out? This is a comical coaching job by Eberflus and Getze, and everybody in the organization who had a hand in these two coming here is responsible for this. I still think Poles deserves one more year. He inherited a complete dumpster fire. But pretty much every major personnel decision, um, I think, has been terrible. There's only been one draft pick they've made that I've liked, and it was Roshan. So, yay, I like the running back you took in the fourth round. Also, Carolina completely bailed out Chicago with an overpayment of the first overall pick this past year for a quarterback that wasn't even Richardson or Stroud. I'm, I'm just done. Chicago fans, you deserve better. Justin Fields, you deserve better. I hope things get better for you guys pretty soon.